This is Bill Henry. I'm just off the main floor of the House of Representatives, and we are waiting now for General Eisenhower to come in. Uh, already we have a tremendously large crowd here. Just a few moments ago, the representatives of the Diplomatic Corps came in, preceding them. Uh, first of all were the, uh, very, the members of the Senate. Uh, the thing has been a sort of a series of setting up exercises for the people who are here because uh, they no sooner uh, sit down after the arrival of one group of dignitaries than somebody uh, hits the uh, gavel on the desk with a terrific wallop and everybody stands up again and a new group of dignitaries come in. Uh, the galleries are jammed to the absolute limit here and so far the escort committee has gone out already now to meet General Eisenhower. The members of the Supreme Court are here. I uh, could see uh, uh, Doug Justice Douglas and Justice uh, Rutledge. Uh, the members of the cabinet have just come in just a moment ago, but I think without any question the greatest amount of applause that anyone has had at all so far was given to the group of GIs who accompanied General Eisenhower across from the other side of the ocean and who were accorded a seat of honor here in the House of Representatives room. Uh, we have just had uh, a, another wallop uh, of the gavel, and I think now that General Eisenhower is approaching. Yes, I think he's due now. We're just looking for him. Here comes down the aisle now. There's tremendous applause here as the general comes down the aisle, uh, preceded by the committee. He's now approaching the marble rostrum. Uh, he looks very happy and healthy. He, there he steps up now. Uh, and looking, well, there he is shaking hands with uh, Senator McKellar and with the Speaker of the House. Uh, he looks excellent, and now he's turning around towards the microphone while the crowd applauds. <laughs> looks as if they're going to applaud all day. He's standing there looking a little embarrassed and bowing and smiling. <laughs> and the crowd isn't going to give him a chance to start his speech. I think they're beginning to quiet down a little bit now. There's the sound of the gavel, and the next voice you hear will be General Eisenhower. Members of the Congress, <laughs> it is my great pleasure and my distinct privilege I'll present to you General of the Army, Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, General Eisenhower. Mr. Speaker Rayburn, introducing General Eisenhower, the crowd have now risen to their feet, all the members of the House, and the applause has broken out all over again. Uh, he's again bowing and quite anxious apparently to get started on this speech, but they're not going to give him an opportunity for a moment. The members of the Diplomatic Corps are applauding very violently over across on the other side of the House, but he's raised his hand now, and I think the General is about to speak. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of Congress, ladies and gentlemen, in the message that I should like to bring to you from the fighting front this morning, there is so much I would like to say, so many subjects I should like to cover, that as the only way of saving an unconscionable trespass upon your time, I have tried to reduce my thoughts to notes, and therefore I ask your permission for me to break my invariable custom, and for once, to use notes in addressing an audience such as this. My imagination could not picture a more dramatic moment than this in the life of any American. I stand before the elected federal lawmakers of our great republic, the very core of our political life and the symbol of those things we call the American heritage. To preserve that heritage, three million American citizens at your behest have faced resolutely every terror 
the ruthless Nazi could devise. I come before you as the representative of those three million people, their commander, because to them you wish this morning to pay the tribute of a grateful America for military victory. In humble realization that they who earned your commendation should properly be here to receive it, I am nevertheless proud and honored to be your agent in conveying it to them. This does not seem to be the moment in which to describe the great campaigns by which the victory in Europe was won. They will become the substance of history, and great accounts they will be. But I think you would want from me some brief estimate of the quality of the sons, the relatives, and friends that you, all America, have sent to war. I have seen the American proved on battlefields of Africa and Europe over which armies have been fighting for more than 2,000 years of recorded history. None of those battlefields has seen a more worthy soldier than the trained American. <laughs> Willingly, he has suffered hardships. Without a whimper, he has made heavy sacrifices. He has endured much, but he has never faltered. His aggressiveness, his readiness to close with the enemy, has become a byword in the embattled armies of Europe. You have read many reports of his individual exploits, but not one-tenth of them ever has been or ever will be told. Yet any one of them is sufficient to fill a true American with emotion, with an intense pride in his country. Never have soldiers been called upon to, to endure longer sustained periods of contact with a vicious enemy, nor greater punishment from weather and terrain. The American has been harassed by fire and automatic weapons, pounded by hand grenades, by artillery, and rocket shells, attacked with tanks and airplane bombs. He has faced the hazards of countless mines and booby traps and every form of static obstacle. He has conquered them all. The tempo of battle has increased tremendously during the span of this conflict. When the Germans launched their blitzkrieg through Poland, the Low Countries, and France, featuring tactical use of air power with the mechanized units on the ground, it seemed to a fearful world that at last there had been achieved the ultimate in destructive force, that nothing can stand against the German army. When America entered the war arena, the Nazi machine was at the zenith of its power. In 1940, it had overrun practically the whole of Western Europe. And a year later, in the East, it had hammered back the Great Red Army into the far reaches of the Russian territory. The Allies met this challenge with vision, determination, and a full comprehension of the enormity of the task ahead. America brought forth her effort from every conceivable source. New techniques of war were developed. Of these, the most outstanding was the completely coordinated use of ground, air, and sea forces. To his dismay, the German found that far from having achieved perfection in the combined employment of all types of destructive power, his skills and methods were daily outmoded and surpassed by the Allies. Through tactical and strategical unification, the Allies successfully undertook the greatest amphibious landings yet attempted in warfare. Following each of these, forces were swiftly built up on the beaches and sustained by our naval strength. The next step was always a speedy advance, applying to the astonished enemy an air-ground teamwork that inflicted upon him defeat after defeat. The services of supply, by their devotion to duty, performed real miracles in supporting the battle lines. America and her allies sent finally into Europe such an avalanche of aggressive power by land, by sea, by air, as to make the campaigns of 1939 and 1940 seem puny in contrast. The result was the unconditional surrender of an arrogant enemy. All this America and her allies have done. The real beginning for us was in December 1941, when our late great war leader, President Roosevelt, met with his friend, Prime Minister Churchill, and forged a definition of Allied organizational and directional method for the prosecution of this war. During most of my three years in Europe, these two God-given men were my joint commanders-in-chief.
Their insistence on making common cause the key to victory established the pattern of the war in Europe. To those two, all of us recognize our lasting obligation. Because no word of mine could add to your appreciation of the man who, until his tragic death, led America in war, I will say nothing other that from his strength and indomitable spirit, I drew constant support and confidence in the solution of my own problems. In Mr. Churchill, he had a worthy partner who had led his country through the blackest hour of 1940. The Prime Minister's rugged determination, his fighting spirit, and his singleness of purpose were always a spur to action. Never once did he give less than full cooperation in any endeavor necessary to our military objectives, and never did he hesitate to use his magnetic and powerful personality to win cheerful acceptance from his countrymen of the great demands he was forced to make upon them. It was no small test of the hospitality and generous understanding of the British people to have two million strangers moved among their already limited and crowded facilities. The added confusion imposed by the extensive gear of a great army was accepted with the cheerfulness that won the admiration of us Americans. In critical moments, Mr. Churchill did not hesitate to cut Britain's already reduced rations to provide more shipping for war purposes. Their overburdened railways had to absorb additional loads until practically all passenger traffic was suspended and even essential goods could be moved only on an emergency basis. For the hospitality the British offered us, for the discomforts they endured on our behalf, and for the sacrifices they made for the success of operations, every American acquainted with the facts will always carry for them a warm and grateful place deep within his heart. Under these two great war leaders were the combined British-American Chiefs of Staff, who were my direct military superiors and the channel through whom I received all my orders. Their unwavering support, their expressed and implied confidence, their wise direction, and their friendliness in contact were things to which I am happy to bear witness. They devised the machinery by which huge Allied forces were put together as a single unit, and through them were implemented the great military purposes that America and Great Britain agreed upon to further the political objectives of the war. The spirit of unison that they developed was absorbed by the forces in the field. In no place was this vital unity more strikingly evident than among the individuals that served as my principal commanders and on my staff. British and Americans forgot differences in customs and methods, even national prejudice, in their devotion to a common cause. Often have I thanked a kind providence for these staunch allies, from highest commander to the newest recruit, and for, the re for their readiness to serve within the team. From our first battle associations with the British Air Forces in England, with our Navy in the African invasion, and with the British armies in North Africa, we have measured their quality to the many months of war. We well know and respect the fighting heart of the British, Canadian, and French soldiers and their leaders. This teamwork was equally strong among the several services, air, ground, navy, and supply. The navy's task in gaining our first European foothold was a staggering one. Without wearying you with tactical details, I ask you to take my word for the truth that in all the brilliant achievements of the American Navy and of her sister service in Great Britain, there is none to excel the record that was written in the great and successful invasions of Africa, Sicily, Italy, and France. With the Navy was always the Merchant Marine, in which Americans had served with a devotion to duty and a disregard for danger and hardship that defies any attempt to describe. To the Air Forces, without whose services all else would have been futile, I, all of us, owe similar debts of gratitude. Perhaps it is best for me merely to say that in every ship, in every plane, in every regiment, was a readiness to give life itself for the common good. And in this statement, I must include the men that have been responsible for the tactics of the battle itself. As an Allied commander, I have tried in London and in Paris to record something of the debt the United Nations owed to the fighting leaders of the British Empire and of France. Today, 
as an American, I should like to give you the names of our own officers that will always rank high in any list of those noted for service to our country. But any enumeration would necessarily be incomplete. So I must content myself by saying that, in great numbers, these battle leaders of the Army, the Navy, and the Air have served loyally, devotedly, and brilliantly in my commands in Europe and in Africa. Particularly, I think you would like to know that without exception, their first concern, their first care, has been the welfare, spiritual and physical, of their men, your sons, relatives, and friends. You have as much right to swell with pride in the quality of the battle commanders you have sent to Europe and Africa as you have in the conduct of the millions they have led so skillfully and devotedly. I've spoken mostly of Americans and British because troops from this country and the British Empire always formed the bulk of my own command. But the campaigns of the Red Army, crushing all resistance in the East, played a decisive part in the defeat of Germany. The abilities of the Soviet leaders and the courage and fortitude of their fighting men and women stir the emotions of anyone who admires soldierly virtues. The Soviet people have been called upon for terrible sacrifices in their own land, ravished by the bestial excesses of the Germans. Driven back to Stalingrad, their calm refusal to acknowledge the possibility of any other outcome than victory will be honored in history for all time to come. <laughs> Finally, when the Russian armies and ourselves started the great drives that met on the Elbe, the end was merely a matter of days. The Allies, East and West, linked up, and Nazi Germany was no more. Here at home, you played a very special part in the Soviet victory. Large quantities of American equipment sent over the Arctic route to Murmansk and up from the Persian Gulf furnished vital material of war to assist the Russians in mounting their great drives. The production of our people has won high praise from the Soviet leaders, as it has from other leaders in the Allied nations. There is not a battlefront in Europe where it has not been of decisive importance. The liberated countries of Europe have played a part in fashioning the victory. Following upon our invasion of Normandy, the breakthrough last summer permitted the swift liberation of most of France and gave that people an opportunity to begin resumption of normal conduct for their own lives. France's own resistance forces, some of her own divisions, took a notable part in driving out the enemy. Every American soldier has seen the toll the war is, is exacted from France. Towns have been destroyed. Broken bridges make difficult road and river transport. The destruction of rolling stock or its allocation to military needs has denied its use to carry needed civilian goods, particularly food and fuel. Even now, although the guns are silent, the urgent necessities of our redeployment to the Pacific make it impossible to do all that we would wish toward improving the trying conditions in which the French people live. This feeling extends also to Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg, which endured four years of German tyranny and which supported effective resistance movements. In the Netherlands, during the last few months of conflict, real starvation prevailed in certain sections, where the German garrisons refused assistance. Our sympathy was aroused, and tons of food were dropped in parachute to alleviate their suffering. Those countries still need and deserve our help. And now, because this meeting typifies for me the spiritual unity of the American home and battlefront, I address a word to that relationship. The American fighting man has never failed to recognize his dependence upon you at home. I am grateful for this opportunity to stand before the Congress and express my own and the thanks of every soldier, sailor, and airman to the countrymen who have remained devoted uh, to their tasks. This feeling goes beyond the tangible things, guns, ammunition, tanks, and planes, although in these things you have sent us the most and the best. It extends to such intangibles as the confidence and sympathetic understanding which have filled the letters written by families and friends to the men up front. For a few moments, simple words of affection and cheer brought out the danger and loneliness and hardship which are the soldier's life. They send him back with renewed vigor and courage to his inexorable task of crushing the enemy. I hope you realize that all you have done for the soldier has been truly appreciated. 
Never have they felt absent from your anxious care and warm affections. The Red Cross, to mean just one outstanding organization, stands high in their admiration. The Red Cross, with its clubs for recreation, its coffee and donuts in the forward areas, its readiness to meet the needs of the well and help minister to the wounded, even more important, the devotion and warm-hearted sympathy of the Red Cross girl. The Red Cross is often seen to be the friendly hand of this nation reaching across the sea to sustain its fighting men. The battlefront and the home front, together we have found the victory. But even the banners of triumph cannot hide from our sight the sacrifices in which victory has been bought. The hard task of a commander is to send men into battle knowing some of them, often many, must be killed or wounded in order that necessary missions may be achieved. It is a soul-killing task. My sorrow is not only for the fine young lives lost or broken, but it is equally for the parents, the wives, and the friends who have been bereaved. The price they pay is possibly the greatest. The blackness of their grief can be relieved only by the faith that all this shall not happen again. Because I feel this so deeply, I hope you will let me attempt to express a thought that I believe is today embedded deep in the hearts of all fighting men. It is this. The soldier knows how grim and black was the outlook for the Allies in 1941 and 1942. He is fully aware of the magnificent way the United Nations responded to the threat. To his mind, the problems of peace can be no more difficult than the one you had to solve more than three years ago, and which in one battle area has been brought to a glorious conclusion. He knows that in war, the threat of separate annihilation tends to hold allies together. He hopes we can find in peace a nobler incentive to produce the same unity. <laughs> he passionately believes that with the same determination the same optimistic resolution and the same mutual consideration among allies that marshaled in Europe forces capable of crushing what had been the greatest war machine in history. The people, the problems of peace can and must be met. He sees the United Nations strong, but considerate, humane and understanding leaders in the world to preserve the peace he is winning. The genius and power of America have, with her allies, eliminated one menace to our country's freedom even her very existence. Still another remains to be crushed in the Pacific before peace will be restored. The American men and women I have been so honored to command would, I know, say this to you today. In our minds and hearts, there is no slightest doubt that our people's spirit of determination, which has buoyed us up and driven us forward in Europe, will continue to fire this nation through the ordeals of battle yet to come. Though we dream of return to our loved ones, we are ready, as we have always been, to do our duty to our country, no matter what it may be. In this spirit, we renew our pledge of service to our Commander-in-Chief, President Truman, under whose strong leadership we know that final victory is certain. now shaking hands with the speaker up there. The applause is tremendous. Everyone is standing on their feet watching the scene. He's turned around again and is smiling at the crowd. The photographers are very busy. He's bowing. It's rather interesting. Now he's leaving the rostrum and uh, starting down the aisle. Everyone in the audience standing on his feet now. He has not yet gone out of the building. They're all standing up. It's a tremendous crowd here. I've never seen as large a crowd in this particular room in the, in the Capitol. Every seat is taken. A great many members of Congress have brought their children along with them. There are vast numbers of children who are apparently having a perfectly wonderful time watching this scene. Upstairs, I'd like to hear some more of this applause. General Eisenhower certainly is receiving a tremendous ovation from this crowd, which has had a wonderful experience in welcoming him here to the Capitol. Uh, there are, is a wonderful representation here of the notables. The members of the President's Cabinet who are here include uh, Secretary Morgenthau, Secretary Stimson, Mr. Forrestal, Mr. Biddle, Mr. Walker, Mr. Wickard, uh, I see Henry Wallace, 
and Madam Perkins is here, and Mr. Statinius, of course, is uh, on the Pacific Coast, but Under Secretary Grew is here. The only uh, member of the cabinet whom I haven't spotted out there is Secretary Ickes, uh, representing the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, there is uh, General George Marshall, Admiral Leahy, Admiral King, and uh, sitting in for General Hap Arnold uh, of the Air Force, who was out in the Pacific, is General Ira Aker, who was the commander first of the 8th Air Force and then of the 15th over in Europe. I have judged that all the members of the Supreme Court are here. I haven't been able to see all of them because of the crowd, but it was a very considerable uh, number of the dignitaries there. The people are still standing. Uh, General Eisenhower has a very busy schedule ahead of him. Uh, he was able to get here on time by some miracle that I'm unable to understand after the rather slow start, which you undoubtedly heard uh, when they arrived a little late at the airport. He goes from here directly to a civic luncheon, uh, after the luncheon, he holds a news conference over at the Pentagon this afternoon. Uh, then uh, I suppose he has a few minutes to uh, rest a little bit. Then he goes to the White House for an informal dinner tonight. And tomorrow, as you know, uh, he goes to New York City where he will receive uh, an ovation such as uh, only New York can give to uh, heroes who come to that great city. Incidentally, at 4.30 Eastern Wartime this afternoon, uh, Gunner back on uh, feature story program will give additional details which you may possibly have missed of the welcome of Washington to General Eisenhower. And now with that, we take you now to New York.